So our next lab is pretty involved. It deals with kinetics. <clears throat> so Dr. Brown has put together a fabulous video to show you what you're going to need to do in the lab. So I wanted to put a little video together to kind of walk you through the theory behind sort of why we're doing what we're doing and, and, and what it all means in terms of how we think about kinetics. So I've got sort of four slides here um, that are available for you to download and, and view and use if you find them to be helpful as you work through not only doing the experimental part in lab, but also doing the data analysis after lab. So here's the chemistry that's going on with this kinetics reaction that we're doing. We're basically looking at S2O8 2 minus and reacting it with I minus to generate I2 and then SO4 minus. So we're interested in looking at how fast this reaction happens. That's what kinetics is. So the problem though is that this reaction is colorless. We don't produce a gas. There's no change in ion concentrations. And so it's really hard for us to really figure out how we're going to measure this. So what is it exactly that we're interested in doing? So this ties into some of the content that you've been learning in lecture. If we have a chemical reaction, we can look at writing what we call a generic rate law. Rate equals rate constant raised to concentrations of reactants to exponents that we call reaction orders. And remember, we cannot use the balanced chemical equation to get us those, those exponents. We need to actually determine them experimentally. So that's what you're gonna be doing in lab. <clears throat> so here is a generic form of the rate law for the chemical equation that we're looking at. And what we're interested in doing in this specific lab is figuring out what those X and Y values are, what those reaction orders are. So the goal of the lab is to be able to write a specific rate law, which means determining the values of these X and Y reaction orders. We're also interested in determining a value for the rate constant. So that's sort of the goal of the reaction. But as I mentioned, if this is the interesting reaction that we're, uh, that we're looking at, uh, the challenge is, is that this reaction, as it happens, is colorless. There's nothing uh, produced in terms of a gas that we can measure. And there's no real changes in ion concentrations that we can measure. And so it's a little bit of a challenge to figure out how we measure the rate of this reaction if there's nothing that we can see. Remember, rate of a reaction is the change in a concentration of a species as a function of time. Well, if there's really no species that we can measure quantitatively, we can't measure its change in concentration. So that's our big question. How do we monitor changes in the rate of this reaction if we cannot look at changes um, and we can't measure the concentration changes in these guys. So what we're going to do in this experiment, there's four trials to this experiment, is you are going to be monitoring how this rate changes as we change the concentrations of S2O8 and I minus. So I'm going to tell you what these names are for these guys. Um, this is a peroxidisulfate ion here, but we're just going to call it S2O8 for right now because that's going to be easier to think about. So how do we monitor again a thing that is uh, a reaction that's colorless, that we have nothing that we can quantitatively look at? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to create a secondary reaction that's going to be sort of a proxy for this. So this slide can get a little bit confusing, but I want to make sure you understand the chemistry that's going on in the flasks that you're looking at. This reaction is going to be what we call an iodine clock reaction, meaning we're going to be able to cycle it back and forth between something that we see and then something that we don't see. So we're going to be able to tell and monitor the time between those changes. So here's this reaction that we just looked at, right? S2O8, which is that uh, peroxidisulfate ion, we're going to be reacting it with an iodide ion. We're going to make iodine, and then we're going to have sulfate. Okay, so this is the reaction that we're interested in. Now, we can't measure color changes in any of these, but what we can do is monitor for the presence of iodine by combining it with starch. Starch is what's called an indicator. This indicator can change blue or black in color. The color change might be a little bit different uh, what you see in lab, but understand that you're going to see a color change when this reaction happens. So again, we're gonna take the product of this first reaction and by reacting it with an indicator, that will tell us that we've confirmed and made that product. So here's where this gets a little bit challenging because 
this reaction sort of would be over instantaneously and we wouldn't be able to kind of monitor how long it takes unless we did something different. So we're going to add in a second sort of competing reaction. Now see if this makes sense. What I've outlined in red here is sort of a competing reaction. It's going to be taking this I2, that iodine that we make, it's going to be reacting it with, this is a, a thiol sulfate ion, S2O3. Now one of the things we have to make sure that we're very careful of is noting that there's a difference between an 8 and a 3 there, which can look really similar. Make sure you don't mix up these reagents. I'm going to call this reaction a loop reagent because what that's going to allow us to do is recycle this I2 minus as I minus. So it doesn't allow this blue reaction to go to completion to that blue black color. Rather, it's going to recycle it and loop it back so that this is the reaction that's happening. Okay, so I'm going to call it a loop reaction. So this loop reaction is going to happen until we use up our loop reagent. Okay, so again, this reaction proceeds until we use up this colorless thiosulfate reaction. So we're looking at this reaction happening, but it's going to kind of go into this uh, or this you know roundabout, if you will, a traffic circle. It's going to kind of keep going around there and picking up and doing chemistry with this passenger until that passenger is all gone. And as soon as that passenger is all gone, then we're going to go in this direction and we'll see our color change. Okay. So without this loop reaction, again, this would be an instantaneous change to our blue-black color. So it's almost like, imagine you were going to run from the, the start of your, your road to the end of your road. Um, you could do that really quickly if you just went in a straight line. But if all of a sudden I had you sort of loop around and around and run in a circle until I told you to stop, or every time you ran into a circle, I kind of gave you a ticket. You couldn't, you couldn't continue on until you got a thousand tickets then you could go on to the finish. Then you'd have a longer time going from start to finish. Okay, so that's the premise of what's going on here is we're creating this loop reaction so that we're able to better time what's going on here. Okay, so again, just highlighting this reaction is going to take um, a place until we use up all of our thiosulfate, and then we're going to see that immediate change. So Dr. Brown has a great video where you actually can see this ahead of time before you do this. So make sure you watch that video so you know exactly the color change that you're going to be seeing. All right, so that's the chemistry that's going to happen. The next two things I want to talk to you about is, well, how do you actually set this up experimentally? And then what are you going to actually do when you execute that? Okay, so your experimental setup, it's a little bit more complicated than we've seen in the past. You're going to have an Erlenmeyer flask, a 250 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask. You're going to have a 100 milliliter beaker. And then you're going to have a set of eight test tubes. Well, you're only going to use seven. And I'll tell you in a minute why this is labeled two through eight, why I don't have a test tube number one. But that's going to be your experimental setup. And super critical to this is making sure that you put the right materials in each thing. Okay, so let's talk first about this Erlenmeyer flask. What goes in there? This is where you have most of your stuff for your reaction. Okay, you're going to have potassium iodide. That's one of our reactants, okay? Depending on what trial you're doing, you're gonna have different volumes of this. Now, the more of that reactant we have, the faster our reaction's going to go. So depending on which trial you'll have, you'll have either a faster or a slower overall reaction. Then we're gonna have our sodium thiosulfate. That's what we call our loop reactant, right? That's gonna be the one that allows us to run in a circle for a little bit. And then there's going to be three extras that you need to have. And these are all important to put in there. We need to have that starch indicator. We're going to have about a milliliter of that solution. We're going to have a little bit of EDTA. Okay, This is there because that sequesters metals and make sure that there's not something else that's causing our chemistry to happen. And then we're going to have uh, potassium nitrate. That's just going to make sure that we keep our ion concentrations constant. So you don't need to sort of know what all of those do, but we need to make sure that they're all there. So lots of things are going to need to go into this Erlenmeyer flask. Okay. 
Next is your 100 milliliter beaker. This only has one thing in it. This has your sodium peroxidisulfate reaction, this S2 a reagent, this S2O8. Remember, what we're really doing chemistry with is this S2O8 and then this I minus, okay? And then we've got that loop reagent. All of these are, remember we did spectator ions last year. So this is a sodium spectator ion, a potassium spectator ion, ammonium spectator ions. They're not doing chemistry, okay? Now the last thing is what goes in these test tubes? Well, these test tubes are this sodium thiosulfate. Now remember I told you I've got these numbered two through eight. Well, where's number one? Number one is actually already in your flask, okay? You've actually already added that one milliliter in by putting it in to start here. This is gonna make a little bit more sense in a minute when we talk about how you actually acquire your data, okay? Each of these test tubes is going to have a milliliter of your loop reagent. Essentially, what's gonna happen is as soon as your reaction turns color, you're gonna add another one of these tubes that adds another one of these uh, loop reagent uh, volumes. And then you're gonna force your reaction to go in a circle again until you use that loop reagent up and then it goes to completion. Then you're gonna add more loop reagent and it goes back and it goes in a circle until it runs out and then it goes to completion. This again is what we call a clock reaction. All right, so let's actually talk about, that's your experimental setup how do you actually do this? And it's really important that you know exactly what you're doing before you start so that you make sure that you are able to acquire some good data. Okay, so whether it's a stopwatch, whether it's your iPhone works really well, you wanna have something that you're measuring time and as soon as you hit start on your stopwatch, you need to be mixing your beaker, the contents of your beaker in with your Erlenmeyer flask. So again, you're putting your beaker's concentration in, you're pressing start on your stopwatch, and you're gonna swirl, okay? Now, once you swirl them together, you shouldn't need to keep swirling, okay? But you do need to be watching. You need to be watching and then making sure that you're keeping an eye on the time. Now, in previous years, we've been able to have two people as partners doing this, one of them kind of being the timer and recorder and another person being the mixer. Well, right now, you have to be all of that. So you have to know what you're doing beforehand so that you know when you need to look at the time, when you need to add something else, when you need to record something and so forth. All right, so I've started my stopwatch, I mixed my stuff together, and now I'm watching my solution. As you saw in Dr. Brown's video, what's going to happen is you're going to see it change color. And it literally changes color like a quick switch. And when it changes color, that's going to be time. Now what that means is you need to look at your clock and you need to record how many seconds have passed. And simultaneously to that, you need to be adding in the next tube of that loop reagent. You need to reset your clock so that you can monitor that time dist or that time um, range again. So just going through again, as soon as you start this reaction, you're starting your stopwatch. As soon as you are watching it and see that it changes color, you need to note the time and then simultaneously try to be adding in your next loop reagent. What I might do is as soon as you see it change time, add your reagent, note the time on your stopwatch, and then in that gap time in between while we're watching and waiting for it to change time again, that's when you can record how many seconds it occurred. Okay, you're gonna watch it again, and then at some point it's going to change again. You're gonna repeat that same process. You're gonna note the time that's passed, and you're gonna add the next test tube of loop reagent that's in there, okay? Because we had, coming back here, eight test tubes total, or seven test tubes versus of loop reagent, you're gonna be resetting your clock seven times. So you should have seven time points at the end. This is a really important thing to note. This is a running clock. You don't stop and start your stopwatch each time. It is a running clock. Now, in theory, you should have about the same amount of time between each of these intervals, assuming that you're adding the same amount of loop reagent each time. So after you do your first time, you should be able to have a good gauge of is it 30 seconds, 45 seconds, two minutes? How much time passes between my first, when it's colorless, till I see a color change? 
okay? So again, you're gonna keep monitoring this and you're going to acquire what we call a time course. You're gonna see how much time has passed between each of the times where it's changed color and you've added another tube of your reagent. So that's pretty much it for your experimental trial. I'll have another video that comes next that talks about some of the theory for what happens when you do your calculations.